plant species, in spite of their diversity, all have a common characteristic, the power to use the energy of the sun directly thanks to an amazing process, photosynthesis. In this program, we'll see how the plant world converts solar energy and how man is trying to do the same. In one of my first biology classes, I learned that photosynthesis was a simple chemical reaction that occurred in the presence of four elements. The sun, carbon dioxide, water, and chlorophyll. I also learned that all organic matter on Earth, including animals and plants, depended via the food chain on that reaction. At that time, I had not fully realized that photosynthesis is a sort of small miracle that constantly provides us with energy. Today, scientists study photosynthesis with leading edge technology, and they're wondering to what degree it is suffering the aftershocks of our environment's deterioration. Our planet would have a completely different appearance indeed if it didn't have its plant life. Everywhere, in forests as in deserts, plants grow, blossom, and bear fruit. The abundance of plants on Earth is explained by a simple fact. They are the only living organisms that can produce their own food. They managed to do this thanks to a process developed some three million years ago, photosynthesis. Microscopic living beings floating about in the primitive seas grew tiny corpuscles, chloroplasts. Owing to a green-colored pigment, chlorophyll, chloroplasts trap solar energy and carbon dioxide and convert them into oxygen and sugar. This invention of nature proved a resounding success. Living beings with chlorophyll capable of photosynthesis had at their disposal an inexhaustible source of energy. They multiplied rapidly, invading land and sea. Photosynthesis is vital to all forms of life as we know it, including ours. It would seem, in fact, that the early plants generated the oxygen in our atmosphere today. And directly or indirectly, all our foods are based on photosynthesis. So our life depends entirely on this biochemical process. Today, photosynthesis has drawn the attention of many scientists. They believe that plant growth varies according to the intensity of photosynthesis. On the other hand, photosynthesis is affected by surrounding conditions. For about the past century, man has been changing conditions on the surface of the planet. These changes may have substantial impact on photosynthesis and therefore on the growth of plants. One of the tools used to study these effects is the phytotron. In this complex of greenhouses and growth chambers, plants can be subjected to the entire range of conditions encountered in nature. A computer linked to various devices varies the factors affecting photosynthesis, intensity of light, humidity of the air, temperature, and even the levels of carbon dioxide in the air. Photosynthesis levels of plants subjected to these various conditions are evaluated by a device that measures the amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the plant. If the quantity of carbon dioxide absorbed by the plant is high, then their photosynthesis rate is equally high. Human activities, such as combustion, for instance, emit large quantities of carbon dioxide. These emissions could cause atmospheric carbon dioxide levels to double within 50 years. Botanists have noted that, like a fertilizer, carbon dioxide encourages the growth of most plants. Using growth chambers, scientists are measuring the effects an increase of carbon dioxide has on the photosynthesis rates of microscopic algae. These small algae reproduce rapidly, roughly two generations a day. This enables researchers to recreate over a four to five month period an atmospheric change that would in real time take almost half a century.
By analyzing the evolutionary response of the algae, the scientists will be able to better predict what changes the future has in store for the plant world. Studies on photosynthesis may also enable scientists to understand the mystery surrounding the decline of our forests. In many countries, entire forests are weakening and dying for no apparent reason. Though several factors are blamed, such as insects and premature frosts, scientists believe pollution to be the main cause of their decline. To verify that hypothesis, researchers designed a veritable stethoscope for plants. The device contains an airtight cell in which the plant is placed for analysis. An intermittent light beam is then directed on the plant. By photosynthesis, the plant begins to emit small puffs of oxygen, which raises the pressure inside the chamber. A highly sensitive microphone picks up the variations in pressure. The higher the variations are, the more intense the plant's photosynthesis. Through this technique, scientists can evaluate a tree's condition after it has been exposed to a pollutant such as ozone. In high doses, this toxic gas will burn leaves. However, the researchers have noted that even in concentrations normally considered harmless, ozone causes a decrease in the photosynthesis rate in trees. This phenomenon might explain why some forests decline, even if they are located in areas where there is little pollution. All these studies make us realize how photosynthesis, a reaction that lies at the very heart of life on Earth, is sensitive to variations in the environment. Changes brought to that process through the activities of man jeopardize the fragile balance of our planet. There are roughly one million plant species on Earth. Every habitat has its own flora. Rivers and lakes, for example, contain a kind of plant life that fascinates scientists. Microscopic algae. These algae use photosynthesis and, like all other plants, help build the gigantic reservoir of green energy available on our planet. In addition to producing the oxygen we breathe, plant photosynthesis is a fantastic source of energy. Like little power stations, plants trap solar energy and convert it into chemical compounds. On Earth, the energy stored by plants is 10 times greater than what man consumes in a year and 200 times greater than his food needs. We already take a great deal of this energy reserve. Fossil fuel, for example, is derived from plant organisms that have trapped and accumulated the sun's energy over millions of years. The same goes for wood, which is the main source of energy in many countries of the world. Even the energy in foods we eat derives, directly or indirectly, from photosynthesis. However, just about everywhere, the energy reserves are going down as we speak. At the same time, some sources of food are being spoiled. To counter possible shortages, scientists are exploring an original alternative. They are trying to harness photosynthesis to produce energy or useful substances. The culture of microscopic algae is one of the measures researchers are considering. These plants store sunlight very effectively in the form of high-energy chemical compounds. Scientists figure that a body of water inhabited by algae is able to capture ten times more energy than a cultivated field or a forest of the same size. We could profit doubly from the photosynthetic power of algae. Indeed, Algae have the property of growing rapidly in water, polluted by the bacterial decomposition of organic compounds such as fertilizers, fecal matter, or food industry refuse. As they grow, the algae absorb the pollutants in the water, thereby purifying the water. Based on this principle, researchers have demonstrated that algae are easily cultivated under specific controlled conditions. 
all they require is polluted water, rich in organic matter, light, and air, which gives the algae the carbon dioxide they need to grow. The algae virtually eliminate all the polluting substances in the water. Moreover, algae generate large quantities of high-energy biological matter. Periodically collected, this biomass can be converted into various products. Since it is high in vitamins and proteins, it can be transformed into food for animals. We might also be able to extract economically valuable chemical compounds, such as natural remedies, aromas, and colorings. Finally, the algae biomass could also be converted into methane gas, a source of energy for home and industry. At present, this technique still being tested in the laboratory is at the pilot project stage. Researchers believe microalgae could easily be cultivated on a large scale, for example, in greenhouses. These cultures would provide vast quantities of food or energy while depolluting waste waters. The cultivation of algae is not the only way to make photosynthesis work for us. Scientists are trying to attain the same goal using a chemical compound in plants, chlorophyll. Their aim is to create a photocell, in other words, a device capable of converting the sun's rays into electric energy. The photocell would work thanks to chlorophyll's distinct properties. The molecules of chlorophyll are somewhat like antennas. When they receive light, they begin to vibrate and then release electrons. Normally, these electrons serve to fuel the photosynthesis process and to produce chemical compounds. But researchers have learned how to use the electrons to generate energy. The photocell they have designed is composed of a glass blade. The blade is first covered with a film of aluminum. Thin layers of chlorophyll are then placed on the aluminum. Finally, the chlorophyll is covered by a thin sheet of silver. When these captors are subjected to a light source, an electric current circulates between the aluminum and the silver. The stronger the light directed on the captor, the greater the electric current. At present, these photocells are not too efficient. They recover less than 1%, while plants manage to use up to 15% of the luminous energy they receive. However, researchers believe that it will be possible to increase that percentage if the other chemical substances normally present in the plant cells are added to the chlorophyll. Once we have fully grasped the amazing phenomenon of photosynthesis, perhaps we will then possess a highly effective means of making the sun's energy ours. What prevents us from using solar energy directly? Its great advantage is that it is inexhaustible and relatively well distributed the world over. Of course, it is unpredictable and intermittent. But if we could store it in barrels, the problem would be solved. The idea of a solar battery wasn't born yesterday. It occurred in 1838 to a French physicist, Antoine César Becquerel, who discovered the photovoltaic effect that makes it possible to convert solar energy directly into electric energy. The photovoltaic cell Becquerel developed would go down through the years. The tiny solar cell that makes your calculator or watch run is one of its direct descendants. Nowadays, the transformation of solar energy into electric energy is just one of the ways to make use of that boundless source of energy. Plants are not the only living beings to live on solar energy. The sun has produced the major part of the energy we consume in the form of fossil fuels, and it also rules the cycle of water evaporation and precipitation that hydroelectricity depends on. But all our energy sources have disadvantages. 
petroleum, coal, and gas are polluting and non-renewable, and hydroelectric projects have an undeniable impact on the environment. As for nuclear energy, it produces dangerous waste we still do not know how to dispose of. Scientists are therefore looking for ways to harness and use the sun's energy directly. Every 15 minutes, the sun provides the Earth with enough energy to meet mankind's energy needs for a whole year. And it is a non-polluting energy, available in unlimited quantity. Several techniques enable us to capture solar energy directly. The thermic solar captor is one such technique. This device collects the light emitted by the sun and transforms it into heat. In fact, if a material is black, it is because it absorbs almost all the visible light. That absorption of sun rays causes the material to heat up. A typical solar captor is made up of a black metal plaque, in the center of which a liquid is circulated. The liquid collects the heat that accumulates on the plaque. It then transmits it to a heat exchanger to heat the water in a reservoir or inside a house. However, in regions with cold seasons, a major part of the heat gathered by the liquid is lost into the air in contact with the captor's metal plaque. So a new generation of solar captors has been developed, captors under vacuum. Their performance is constant, even during the coldest winter days. Because they enable us to obtain much higher temperatures, up to 120 degrees Celsius. Solar captors pave the way to new applications. The steam they produce could activate pumping or air conditioning systems, purify water by distilling it, and even make coffee. However, solar capter technology has its limits. Even though the surface of the sun reaches temperatures of 6,000 degrees Celsius, the solar energy that reaches us is attenuated. In the best of conditions, the amount of energy received by one square meter of the Earth's surface is barely more than 1,000 watts, or one-fifth of the energy used in a kitchen. Furthermore, solar captors only convert 30 to 40 percent of the solar light they receive into heat. It's worth mentioning that the heat gathered by solar captors is a very difficult form of energy to store. We have to be able to store it so we can use it when the sun is down. To solve this problem, researchers are experimenting with a chemical heat pump that would build up a reserve of energy during sunny days and restore that reserve during the night or on cloudy days. It works on the principle of reversible chemical reactions. The heat produced by the solar captor warms the salts contained in the reactor. Ammonia gas is released. Going through a condenser, it becomes liquid and is stored in a reservoir. To obtain heat when desired, the ammonia is directed to the evaporator where it becomes gas again. The gas is absorbed by the salts, causing a great release of heat in the reactor. When the gas evaporates, it creates a cooling effect, which could be used in an air conditioning system. The thermic solar captor is not the only device capable of trapping the energy radiated by the sun. For several years, photovoltaic cells make a number of machines work, from calculators and satellites to highway emergency telephones. Unlike thermic solar captors, photovoltaic solar captors convert solar light into electricity. Photovoltaic cells are based on the existence of materials that are called semiconductors. These materials, the most well-known being silicon, have a special property. When silicon atoms receive photons, the small particles that constitute light, they emit electrons. Some electrons can be picked up by electrodes. These free electrons then create an electric current. 
photovoltaic cells can be connected together to form solar panels. When exposed to light, these panels sometimes produce as much as 12% of solar energy into electric energy. When not in use, the electricity produced can be stored in batteries for future use. Even if it is unlikely that the sun will ever meet all our energy needs, advances are being made in solar technologies. And they will certainly have, among the energies of tomorrow, their place in the sun. The sun is not only a source of physical energy, it is a source of psychic energy as well. A day without sun and some of us become irritable. More than two weeks without sun and we're ready to pack our bags and go around the world in search of it. <laughs>